Hi guys. Uh, so in this video, we are going to see the third method of amortized analysis or amortized time complexity. Now, if you are following all my videos, uh, this question would have arised in your mind that uh, why are we looking at so many methods to do the same time complexity computation? Like we have already learned the accounting method, the aggregate method of amortized analysis. So why again do we need potential method? That is because uh, there are many data structures out there for which potential method can act as a better alternative rather than the other two methods. In the same way, there are other uh, data structures out there for which one of these three methods or there is another met method known as charging method, but it is not used much. So one of these three methods can be used in a much better way than the other, th other two methods. But there are some examples, of course, like dynamic tables, uh, like we saw in the last two videos, which can be used with all the three methods. Uh, even in this video, at the end, I'll uh, finally derive the time complexity of dynamic tables with the potential method as well. Now, what is potential method? So uh, basically, when we talk about a potential method, at any given point of time in a particular data structure, there is a potential, right? Uh, like how in the accounting method, there was a kind of a bank balance or, or there was a balance. In the same way, in the potential method for any data structure on which we are performing the time complexity computation, we assume that at any given point of time, it is having a particular potential right and for ease of understanding we take the initial potential of the data structure as d0 right and uh, uh, here it is written that operation i transforms the data structure from di minus 1 to di so this is the terminology that we are going to use in the derivations as well at, at the end part of this video and uh, the actual cost of the ith operation is uh, denoted by ci uh, so that we have seen in the previous video as well that CI is actually the actual cost and CI cap is the amortized cost, right, of the ith operation. So now we here we define a potential function and uh, the potential, as I said earlier, is uh, zero of the data structure at the, the initial potential is zero. And later on, the potential should be anything greater than or equal to zero. So the potential methods uh, tells us that the amortized cost is equal to the actual cost plus change in potential, okay? So if you write it in terms of symbols, so it will uh, actually ci cap is equal to ci plus phi of di minus phi of di minus 1. Or this these two terms will actually uh, boil down to delta of phi, phi i, right? So now if we consider two situations, if delta of phi i is greater than 0, this, uh, this will mean that my ci cap uh, is actually greater than ci, right? So this actually is a situation of overcharging or you have actually overcharged or overestimated your time complexity of the operation. Th that is why the amortized cost that you have assigned is greater than the actual cost, right? So this is actually overcharged. And in the uh, other case, if my else, if uh, delta of uh, phi i is less than zero, that will imply ci cap is less than ci. In this case, uh, uh, it will be a, an undercharging, right? Or you have undercharged the operation. You have underestimated the time complexity of the operation by giving a lesser, by assigning a lesser uh, amortized time complexity than the actual cost of that operation. So in case of overcharged, what will happen is that as uh, it is written over here, the potential of your data structure will increase and this potential you can use later on to do other operations, uh, other costlier operations. Whereas in case of undercharged, uh, uh, what will happen is that the opposite of this will happen or the potential of your data structure will decrease and the potential that you have accumulated until now in the data structure that will get used up for you to perform this operation. So these were the two uh, situations overcharged and undercharged. So now uh, let us look at the look at the example of augmented stack. If you have seen my previous uh, video of amortized analysis, you will know that augmented stack actually has three operations: the push, the pop, and the multi pop. Whenever we are doing uh, using potential method, it is very important for us to actually know the potential function of the data structure. Like we have to define a potential function uh, phi 
for each and every data structure. Now, this is something that is actually predefined. We don't have to calculate it. That is actually calculated after or determined after doing a lot of computations. And it is chosen because it actually gives the best analysis of time complexity. So the potential function for augmented stack is basically, or you can say it phi di is basically number of elements in the stack, right? So this is the potential function for the augmented stack. That means we will use this to calculate the asymptotic time complexity using the potential method. Okay, we, we will use this formula itself that is ci cap is equal to ci plus phi di minus phi di minus 1. Right, we are just going to use this formula itself. The time complexity or the amortized time complexity for a single push. What will be the amortized time complexity for a single push? So uh, what is the actual cost for a single push? Because it is a constant time operation, we take it as 1 plus. Uh, now, what is actually the final? This is actually the final potential after the operation is done. So let us assume that the number of elements in the stack before the push were n. And after the push, after a single push, what will be the number of elements in the stack? They will increase by 1. They will become n plus 1. So uh, the final potential is actually n plus 1. We are actually going by this potential function that we know for the augmented stack. And initially the number of elements in the stack or the initial potential of the stack was n. So this will actually turn out to be 2. So the amortized time complexity for the push operation is 2. In the same way, if we perform it for the pop operation. So the actual cost for the pop operation is actually 1 because it is a constant time operation. And let us assume that the number of elements uh, in the stack before the pop operation were n. So when you do the pop operation, the number of elements in the stack will reduce by 1. They will become n minus 1. So the final potential will be n minus 1 minus, we are actually using this formula. And the initially the number of elements were n. So now this will actually cut and this will also be cut and so we'll remain with zero. So the time amortized time complexity for the pop operation is actually zero. Now let us find the amortized time complexity using the potential method for the multipop of k operation. So now uh, because it is multipop of k that means k elements will be popped out. So let us assume that initially there were n elements in the stack and uh, after uh, the multipop operation, how many elements will be left? n minus k because k elements are being popped out. So what is actually the actual cost of this operation of multipop of k? The actual cost will of course be a k into a single pop. So that will be k plus uh, the final potential will be n minus k because after uh, multipop of k, n minus k elements will remain minus of n. So in this also k and k will get will be cut and n and n will also be cut and the time amortized time complexity of the multipop of k is also coming out to be as zero right so these are actually the amortized time complexities of different operations in the augmented stack which we have actually determined using this formula right so now we will actually look at the example of dynamic tables that we have seen for the uh, other two methods of amortized time complexity that is the accounting method and the aggregate method now we will Try to find out the time complexity for n insertions and a single insertion uh, for dynamic tables using the potential method. So this uh, process is also known as uh, table doubling because the table is always doubled whenever there is an overflow. So if you have not watched the previous video, please go to the previous video where I have actually clearly explained what are dynamic tables, right? And how do they actually work? So we know from uh, those videos that actually the actual cost for a dynamic table is i when i minus 1 is an exact power of 2 whereas it is 1 otherwise. And for the dynamic tables the potential function is actually predetermined and we don't actually need to calculate it and the potential function is actually 2i minus 2 raised to the raised to log c of log i right to the base 2. So this is actually the potential function, right? So now uh, let us consider two cases. This is case 1 and this is my case 2, right? So now uh, we will be using this formula to derive the time complexity of dynamic tables 
uh, derive the time complexity of insertions in dynamic tables. So let us make our cases over here and uh, because we have to use the same formula, let us write it down. Ci cap is equal to Ci plus phi of di minus phi of di minus 1, right? So this is our formula. So now for case 1, the amortized time complexity for a single operation is equal to uh, using the same formula, the actual cost for case 1 is i, right? This is our case 1. So the actual cost is i plus uh, what is phi of di? Uh, it is actually already given 2i. So we don't need to worry what uh, how this is actually determined. This is determined in the best way possible by doing a lot of computations so that we actually get the best result from our this time complexity analysis using potential method. So 2i minus 2 of log i minus, now we are doing this term. Uh, so instead of i, uh, i, we will just replace it with i minus 1. 2 of i minus 1 minus 2 of log i minus 1, right? So now uh, let us simplify this. So this will be i plus here uh, 2i and 2i will get cut, right? Uh, then this will be 2 into uh, here uh, it will be this was actually 2i minus 1. So this will actually uh, be 2 we will get this as 2 minus into minus plus minus 2 raised to the log i minus no this will be plus minus into minus 2 raised to log i minus 1 right so now uh, how we are going to solve this 2 raised to log i and 2 raised to log i minus 1 for that we need to actually have a look at this property or this case which we are actually referring to right now case 1 where i minus 1 it is given it is an exact power of 2. So let us do this with the help of an example. Suppose let me take i as 9 because I want to take i minus 1 as an exact power of 2. So 8 is an exact power of 2. Uh, so if I try to solve this term that is 2 raised to log i. So this will be uh, i is actually 9 in this case. So log 9 to base 2. This is actually coming out as uh, 2 raised to 4 because it will be 3 point something uh, inside the seal and then it will finally turn out to be 4. So this is 16, right? Uh, now if I try to solve this, I'm just uh, explaining you with the help of an example so that you can clearly understand why I'm going to write it, write the next step that way. Uh, so this will be log i minus 1 is 8. So this actually uh, using logarithmic property, we can uh, uh, this 8 will come over here and it will replace 2 and 2 will go up. So uh, basically this is 8. So what is 8? 8 is actually i minus 1, right? So we found out this term as i minus 1, right? Whereas this term 2 raised to log i is actually 16. So what is 16? 16 is basically 2 into i minus 1 or i minus 1 is 8 and so this I have explained with the help of an example. Uh, otherwise also on, through, only in, through intuition you can understand that why these property holds or what I am going to write i plus 2 minus this is actually uh, we have got 2 into i minus 1 plus i minus 1. So this will be i plus 2 minus i minus 1. So this will get cut and finally we are remained with 3. And uh, the, so the amortized time complexity of a single insertion in case 1 it comes out to be constant or 3, right? So now uh, let us solve it for the second case and see that what, what is the time complexity that we get for the second case, this case, when i minus 1 is not an exact power of 2. So again, we'll be using the same formula. And in this case, the actual cost, we are using this formula, the actual cost ci uh, is basically 1 plus phi of di is uh, again this will remain as same uh, minus 2 of i minus 1 minus 2 of log i minus 1 right so now we can simplify this uh, this 2i and over here uh, 1 2i will get cut so we'll get 1 plus 
and we will also get one 2 over here uh, th because this is minus 2 and then when it will come out minus into minus plus 2. So 1 plus 2 this term minus 2 raised to log i plus 2 raised to log i minus 1. So we are given that i minus 1 is not an exact power of 2, right? So when i minus 1 is not an exact power of 2, when i minus 1 is not an exact power of 2, the, in that case, 2 raised to log, seal of log i will be equal to 2 raised to seal of log i minus 1. If you think a little bit, you will understand this, that why I have written it this way, that 2 raised to seal of log i will be equal to 2 raised to seal of log i minus 1 in the case when i minus 1 is not an exact power of 2 because right now we are doing case 2. So in that case, when this and this will be equal because there is a minus sign here and a plus sign here, so we, this will get cut and we'll again be remained with 1 plus 2 that was equal to 3. So the time complexity for a single insertion is again 3 even for case 2. So this was the time complexity for a single insertion in dynamic table and when we talk about the time complexity for n insertions in a dynamic table, it will be n or the number of operations into the time complexity for a single insertion that is 3. So it will turn out to be as big O of 3n or you can also call it as big O of n. But do you remember? Big O of n is actually the time complexity that we found out for dynamic tables for n insertions even in the case of aggregate method and also for the accounting method and that is the same time complexity that we are getting even in the case of potential method. So potential method is basically considered the, uh, the most powerful method. Now you might be uh, thinking that why actually then we are not using potential method all the time. The reason is because of this, the potential function. We can't actually define a potential function very easily. It is done after a lot of computation. That is why a, a potential method cannot be used at all places, even though it, uh, when it gives a tighter bound may, in many cases. So that is why uh, sometimes we prefer potential method and in other cases we use uh, other methods like aggregate method and accounting method, which are much simpler, but they give a lesser tighter bound. So this was all about amortized analysis. Uh, in, from the next video onwards, we will start our first advanced data structure that is optimal binary search tree. So until then, share this video as much as possible and let me know if you like the video in the comments and also if you have got some suggestions.